One of my least favorite parts of doing reviews is the process of like fake setting everything up and hoping you don't miss anything. Hey, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. And today I'm reviewing Ultra from Machete Games, a game, a cooperative experience of, of storytelling, of scenarios as you wander around the board, taking actions, ultimately trying to outpace the threat in front of you. The game's going to have a specific story deck, a story deck that's going to give you, well, a story, uh, some sort of narrative that you're going through. And the game comes with a few stories, one short introductory one, a bunch of long ones, and along with that, you're going to match a chronicle card as well. You're going to match this chronicle card with a story, and by this chronicle card, I mean any of the variable chronicle cards they give you. You're you're going to have the chronicle card over there, you're going to have the story cards, and throughout the course of the game, you're slowly going to be flipping through the story, reading the events one at a time, dealing with the various consequences, but with that, let's go ahead and dive into the general sequence of, well, how this goes. Every single turn, you're going to go ahead and roll the die. You're going to roll this dice over here, taking a look at whatever it says, and this means you go ahead and move this one, taking the action over here. This is going to move from here to here to here, and then looping back around, at which point you will unveil the next section of the chronicle. That's the sequence you're going through. The option you have are one movement, one movement, one movement, one movement, both of those are all, well, all four of those are one movement, staying in place, which is possible everywhere except for over here. Whenever you would do a staying in place here, you move to the next one, and staying in place does not mean you do nothing, it means you take the action of that location a second time. So if you stay in place over here, you will again draw another one of these cards, rolling the dice, and putting that out on spot two, which is going to set it into panic over there, because now there are four cards over there. That's what's gonna happen over here. And the last spot is where you get to move twice, and again, similarly, moving twice means you'll skip from here to here, but if you roll twice over here, you will simply go over here. The Chronicle is on a fixed schedule. The Chronicle is always on a fixed schedule and always operates a certain way, meaning it basically operates once per loop. You can't operate twice per loop, and you can't skip it. The Chronicle must be gone through. Luck plays a part in this game, but it does not play a part in the Chronicle. Well, I guess it does play a part in how often the Chronicle goes because you could have this activating over there 14 times in a row that is possible luck still plays a part in the chronicle but less so i guess a little bit less so that's the general sequence. What do these spots do? Well, over here, like I said already, you're going to read the Chronicle. Every time you go over here, you're going to flip the next page. You're going to read the events, do whatever it says. We're going to read seriously on the run. One dark and stormy night, a group of horsemen appear up at the fortress gates. They are escorting a young lady of high lineage. Princess Melly, heiress to the neighboring satrapy, has been exiled by her cousin and is seeking refuge with the rangers. You welcome her, her loyal subjects, and her retinue. This already makes me want to play this Chronicle. I have not yet played this Chronicle. I've played through most of the Chronicles, but I still have a few to go, and this is one I have not played. Maybe I play this after this review. We'll see. I don't know. But that's what you do with the Chronicle spot. You read the Chronicle. Sometimes I'll have events, but to avoid spoilers, I will not heavily. I'll look at this myself and give you an idea of what's coming up. Well, now we have an event that has a specific criteria. So now, once you go to the next page, there are specific criteria that, depending on those criteria, different things will happen, and those events will continue to play and possibly branch as you go through the Chronicle. The Chronicle's different ways they play out, different ways they potentially branch, different impacts, and there eventually is a win or lose aspect at the very end of it, the entire way along, you're basically trying to keep things as in control as possible because it will affect how well you're able to do on the Chronicle. So that's the Chronicle spot. From there we have over here, when we move over here, we're going to, like I showed you already, roll a die and put a card out on a specific spot and that will potentially send that place into panic, which will affect whether we can call for help from the villagers or all of that. And then that's actually not true. The villagers' help is going to be this spot over here where we draw a problem. Again, we roll, we put it out on spot six, and we now have a problem in play. Let's go ahead and read that problem to you. We have mild epidemic. The villagers are afflicted by an infectious disease. Spirits are low and some people are worried. We're going to do a skill check over here as one of our actions before we can call for aid from the villagers. Each of the spots in the game has a call for aid option, but if there's a problem going on, you can't call for aid. That's going to be this deck over here. And then lastly, we have the event deck where we move over here and we read an event which are either one-time events or they are ongoing events, but the event will be in this case, Surprise Inspection. The Commander of the Ranger Corps has sent you a delegation to check on the progress. If the castle's flag over here is three or less, all rangers lose a health, and it is currently at three, which means, sadly, we all lose a health. It's very unfortunate. It's sad, but has to happen over here. Let's go ahead and pip these down over here, moving these each down one, and that might affect on some of us over here, for instance, on Mava, because we've moved past the little Eximal, we cannot benefit from her ability until we rest, so we're going to want to get her rested as soon as possible. That's the bad stuff that happens in the game, which takes us to our turn where we can take actions, actions that benefit, benefit well, us. The Rangers are going to go ahead and take actions, and this, by the way, this moves on every single Ranger's turn, so whether you're playing a one, two, three, four character game, 
you're always going to be activating this ranger's turn so on on each ranger's turn so it balances around that but over here on the ranger's turn you're going to take two actions and they must be different actions although you could go ahead and trade in two bread to take a bonus action which could be the same as one of the prior actions you took so bonus actions are good because they're more flexible although they do cost two bread what are the actions you can take you can rest and heal a bit, as well as gaining bread. Bread is helpful, healing is helpful. Both those things are good. Uh, you can go ahead and move from a location to a location. So you can move to an adjacent location around the board. So from here to here to here, or always to the castle and to someone else, which means every spot on the board is always a maximum of two spots away. So that's the good news there. Uh, from there, you can go ahead and resolve a problem. You can take a test in a location with a problem, rolling against the problem. In this case, we're gonna do a test over here. We need to get one success over there, and we're doing a test based on that little attribute. We have one from the course at it all over here. You always have a minimum of one die rolled. We have one from the library, that's two. And because we're using him, he currently is that attribute. He's in a, he's a, a city over here. He's this character as well, which means he's going to be rolling three dice. We're going to go ahead and see if we can get a success. We should be able to. Well, we got a success, but it's not a very good success because these successes come at the cost of health. So we're going to go ahead and activate this success over here, but that does mean we're going to lose a health as well. Ideally, we want this success and then this blanks as well. Those are the three sides you have on the dice. That will go ahead and resolve this problem. And now the good news is now for a second action, he can go ahead and call for help from the villagers, raising his help to two over there, and that would be a classic turn. The other things you can do is you can try to resolve these problems. Let's go ahead and show you one of those. Uh, let's say it's this character's turn now. We again, we roll the dice over here. We resolve this. We move this one. We read the chronicle. And then over here, she's going to resolve a duel at dawn. All the location cards have a name on them, which granted could involve a degree of memory if you really know everything, but really just give you an idea of what's happening. Uh, and these decks, by the way, these are variable. There's a whole stack of them you're always going to mix together two depending on the specific chronicle uh, depending on the specific chronicle in play going back to this card over here so we have a duel at dawn let's go ahead and read that let's cover this part over here a duel at dawn Two fierce one warriors are locked in a merciless battle. You arrive at the exact moment when the one defeats the other. You intervene to prevent the winner from dealing her opponent the final blow. The winner agrees to spare the loser's life, but only if you are able to defeat her. That's what's going on there. From there, we're going to go ahead and test. Now, this, depending on how you're doing it, you can have another player read it to you. If you're playing it solo, strictly speaking, it's not a solo game, but I've played most of my games with a solo. Uh, if you're playing it solo or however you're doing it, you can just go ahead and test against that. In this case, we're using her. Her skill attribute is that, plus we always have one from the castle over here. So we're going to go ahead and roll two dice over there. Let's go ahead and roll two dice. And we got one success at the cost of a health. Let's go ahead and take that and read the consequences. One success, oh, this is one of those things that had two successes on it. Sometimes it's a simple pass-fail. You either pass or you fail. Other times the number of successes does matter. One success, your blades are unable to determine a winner or a loser. The duelist agreed to say it's a tie and leaves and nothing happens. Had we failed, bad things would have happened. Had we gotten two success, good things would have happened. And that's the other action here. Lastly, the last action you could take is returning to the Citadel and going ahead and building one of the buildings on the sidebar over here. You can have the variety of buildings you can add. You have to pay the specific cost. These should really be flipped over, showing you the cost on them. So you can go ahead and pay the cost if you have it. Uh, that's gonna be one of those things where if we wanted this, we can go ahead, when we have one of our other characters over here, we can call for aid, grabbing one of these, putting into our general supply of resources, and then spend that resource over here to build the tavern as an action, adding the tavern to our board, and now having us roll one more dice whenever we're doing those types of tests and those are the core aspects of what you're doing in ultra you're running around taking two actions a turn every single turn you're rolling to advance the various bad stuff that pop up both the main storyline itself as well as the various problems and the encounters you have over here the events which are sometimes positive but usually not so positive and sometimes stay in your way like a thorn in your side stopping you from doing one thing or the other until the next event pops out you're trying to deal with all this all while trying to slowly resolve the Chronicle. One thing we didn't talk about is in addition to the fact that you're going to get an ongoing degree of assignments from the story you're playing, you're also going to have this Chronicle card which gives you some specific things you want to do which will help you in the final showdown. These Chronicle cards over here give you specific aspects. You want to have two protected regions. We'll talk about protected regions in a second. You want to have some, you want to give in a coin. You want to have the factory, two more protected regions, and these will give you these little coins that will go on these cards and will help you in the final encounter. These are very important. You do not want to neglect them. As far as protected region the region is protected when you have cleared all the problems from a region and you have gone ahead and built one of these towers over here you're going to pay the resources on it so we pay those two resources we place the tower down in one of the towers we advance that by one and now once this is clear that region becomes protected and whenever things happen that are bad there they no longer happen and they're no longer bad there and that is basically how you play the game so Review. Let's go ahead and get on into it. 
Ease of play. The game is fairly easy to dive into. Rulebook, it has a decent amount going on. Not a crazy ton, but, you know, we have a few pages and all that stuff. Nothing nothing over the top. Nothing too complicated. Fairly easy to dive into. I, I would say it's more complicated than it needs to be. A basic sequence you're going to have is you're going to go ahead and roll a die, move the stuff around the board, take your two actions, rinse and repeat. The actions can't be identical. From there, there's a list of actions and then a bunch of edge cases to be kind of aware of. Fairly easy to dive into. Gameplay tends to come in at roughly an hour. The box says 60 minutes. That's, that's on point. I would say roughly an hour. Hour. A slow game is maybe 90 minutes, fast game maybe 45, but it's a fairly fairly consistent game, I would say, for most of my plays. As far as player count, this is officially a 2-4 to four player game. I say officially because I have played this at 1, 2, and 3 players, and a majority of my plays have been playing this one solo. I played it a bunch of 2 players, uh, one, well not a bunch, I played it twice 2 players, one 3 player, and the rest of my plays have been solo. It works just fine solo. I don't know why it's not recommended as a solo experience. I guess arguably because some, some of these cards over here have a degree of, you know, uh, seeing something on it. But literally, this is what I do every turn, okay? I go ahead and grab a card, and I flip it every single time like this. Every single time, that's exactly what I do. I get to see nothing, none of it's spoiled. And then the best part is I get to do what I like to do in solo games and story games, which is I get to go ahead and just read it to myself. I like the story, I do, but I find I don't love... When I'm not heavily invested in the story, if it's not like a full-blown story that you're really investing in, I find I don't like having other players read narrative text to me again and again and again and again. Because this game, you know I said 60 minutes? 60 minutes is when playing it solo and when playing it two players and rushing through the text. If every single encounter is a very nice, polite, loud reading, you surprise a group of pillagers who have come to raid a cluster of independent farms. You plunge headlong into the group, swinging your sword over your head. It's great. It is, but it will slow down the game when you have a ton of cards to go through, additional problems, additional events, and of course the chronicles themselves and so, or the uh, the, the, the chronicles themselves. Yeah, that's the one. But anyways, yeah. Uh, the story, it, I like I like diving into solo. I would say solo is my favorite player count because of that. The game is the same experience, but it's faster, and it, it gives me the same experience, but it's faster is what I'm trying to say. But past that, two and three players will also find uh, when you play it solo, you are going to control multiple rangers. You will never control a single ranger, so it's not true solo, but, but yeah, it does work fine solo. As far as what I like, don't like, and can see how it's not liking. Starting off with the fact with what we just talked about, which is the story. I do like the story in this game. I find the story engaging. I find that the the little chronicles keep you coming back. The scenarios you have every single time, they keep you coming back to dive into it. Even just now, starting off that scenario had me wanting to, to pl play this. I want to sit down and play through that scenario because because it's there, and because it represents a new story built around the engine that I like. And then you combine the fact that there's tons of cards. There are different decks you're going to have, depending on which of these uh, you grab over here, which of these, I don't remember what they're called, but these things that go along with the Chronicles, they're called something, but they go along with the Chronicles over here. Whatever you have over here, I, I find myself constantly engaged with just the general world around us, the general world being created by these decks of cards, by the problems, by the events, and then the specific story you're going through and how they all intermingle in a narrative. A narrative that has you here as rangers protecting a satrapy, dealing with the villagers, helping them out, dealing with whatever problems pop your way, the good, the bad, the ugly. It really feels like you're part of a small enclave, a little Robin Hood-esque kind of situation, except you're not fleeing from the law. You are the law and you're helping enforce it. And I like that sense of story that it has and the fact that everything has additional little stuff just just hinging around that story as you build up this atrophy as you encounter the problems and as you hopefully make your way to the end while well, resolving everything the characters have meaningful abilities all the characters have found little abilities my personal favorite which is a little broken honestly but i found consistently the strategy that i tend to like although i i try not to do it every single time because i find it works a little too easily is using conrad over here having conrad pop out over here because conrad's action is that he can take the same action twice I enjoy having Conrad pop over here and then continuously just level this up every single time because as you level this up, it goes to the top and then when you get to the top, you can simply start discarding other cards around the board, which really helps you get a lot of control. That's strong with anyone with Conrad because he can take the same action twice. That breaks the game for me. I, I, I like the strategy and I use it when Chronicles are a little harder, but it's a you shouldn't do the same thing every time. It's not going to make the game fun for you. But, but yeah, the characters have meaningful abilities, different ways they break things, that they can pop over to the fortress every single time. They can take the same action twice over here. Here we have Lars. When Lars performs a rest action, he gains an additional health and bread, helping him both be more resistant to the bad things that are happening and gain earn those bonus actions, which again can be very useful, no different than Conrad's ability to take the same action twice. And so all the actions in this game are meaningful in their own different ways, and they all help you just break the game in fun, little, powerful ways, and I enjoy and appreciate those. And then to augment that, you're powering up the buildings in this atrophy at the same time. You're constantly adding these buildings to the supply, adding the towers, which may or may not, depending on which towers you add, they may or may not come with extra as well but you're building up your forces you're building up your strength and you're getting better at 
well, everything, as the game gets harder, as these cards keep flipping, and as the challenges get harder, and as your resistance to things is a little trickier, you are building up the world around you, and it has that. And the game is generally fairly tight. I say generally because, again, I find that Conrad's strategy a little powerful. Not, not like, guaranteed powerful, but it is a little powerful. But past that, I do find the game is consistently tight. The game is throwing things at you while you level up, and then you get to the end game, and depending on the scenario you're playing, depending on the chronicle you're playing, you often have to face off against something that will require you to have done well the entire time. If you did well the entire time, great. If you didn't, you'll continue playing. You'll go through the entire game, but you may well lose or just not do as well as you otherwise hope, and I find the game has that decent balance. Uh, that's basically as far as the things I like. As far as things I don't like in this game, a few things, two things really. First of all, the core gameplay loop is, is fairly repetitive. To me, the story is essential to keep me interested in coming back to this one. The core gameplay loop is every single turn, you go ahead and you roll a die and you move this thing over here and then you go ahead and take two actions. Half the time those actions are moving, like literally half the time those actions are moving and so a lot of your actions in the game are just moving around the board then resolving the specific cards, going through it. To me, the only thing that keeps me coming back to this game, although it does keep me coming back to this game, is the story aspects. Having the aspects of having the story evolve as I go through it. Having the cards be a bit of a surprise. The core gameplay loop otherwise is boring. Uh, often, most of your actions are going to be move over here, resolve a card. Move over here, resolve a card. Move over here, resolve a card. And a little more efficiently than that, not the way I actually just did that over there. But that core gameplay loop is fairly repetitive. It's fairly cyclical. And the thing that keeps me coming back is the story. The, the mechanics in this one on its own are not enough. And then secondly, speaking of mechanics, the entire game, left, right, and center, is luck, 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 luck. A little bit more luck, followed by a little bit more luck in everything you're doing. From the cards you draw, from the fact that you don't even know what's coming, which isn't technically luck, but the fact that you don't know what's coming when you first dive into a chronicle means, as far as you're concerned, it's luck. As far as you're concerned, it's the unknown. You're preparing for the unknown, and then that unknown is compounded by the fact that you're going to be drawing cards from this deck, drawing cards from this deck, drawing events from this deck, rolling dice every single other second to go ahead and take the variety of skill tests you're doing, rolling dice to see how far and fast things move, rolling dice to see where things land, constantly dealing with the fact that every single card is its own little miniature version of luck as far as what you're going to encounter. Everything in this game is luck. The mechanics are not what keeps me interested in Ultra. The story is, and the mechanics are a nice little background to make the rest of it work for me. As far as what I, as what I, as far as what I can see, I was not liking. First of all, is going to be that luck aspect. I know I mentioned what I can like, but I feel it's worth doubling down on. There's a lot of luck in this game. The mechanics are basically... Luck, luck, and then story. That's that's what's going on here. I like the game. I really do. We'll get into it in final thoughts, but it's luck, luck, and then story are the mechanics of Ultra. And then past that, as far as replayability. The other thing worth noting is replayability. I personally do not plan on playing encounters twice. I say that having already played some of the uh, the Chronicles twice. I have played some of them, specifically when I was introducing the game to other players. So that first Chronicle I played like three times, and the second one I played twice. The rest of them I've all played once, and the only reason I would play a Chronicle again is to introduce other players to this game. For me, I'm happy there is an expansion already announced to this game because... My goal with this game is to play through the Chronicles I have, maybe pick up promo or Chronicles that are available, pick up the expansion and see what that adds. I do not find the game mechanics alone compelling enough to dive into the same Chronicle a second time. I want that sense of exploration mixed in with it. And so, if you, and for me, that's not a problem. The reason it's not a problem for me, to be very clear, is because I don't mind playing through Ultra 10 times then moving on from it. That doesn't bother me at all. But if you're looking for a game that will continuously reward you again and again, and will continuously give you reasons to dive into it, you may not have a problem with replayability, but you also might. And if you are, if you find yourself like me, understand that I consider Ultra a limited play game. It's not limited, there's no legacy elements, there's nothing you're breaking up, but I think the game has, what is it, eight chronicles? Let me just quickly check here. The game comes with, it says somewhere here, there's somewhere we have, it said somewhere, there's short chronicles and long chronicles, and it said it's somewhere, but I don't know exactly where it's at anymore, so I'm going to go, here we go, here we go, list of chronicles. We have six chronicles in the game. We have the open door starting chronicle, and then we have five chronicles left, which means I only haven't played one chronicle, which is a shame. I need one chronicle left to play, which is the one here, and then I'll be done with it. But when I say done with it, I mean that I'll, I'll wait for the expansions, because I, I yeah, I just, uh, past introducing it to others, I wouldn't play this a second time. That's where I am with this one. As far as final thoughts on Ultra, I really like Ultra with caveats. And the caveats are mostly present if you didn't skip here and you heard everything here because I'm not going to say anything new here. I really enjoy my experience playing Ultra. I have a lot of fun every time I play it. And even right now, as I flip to the final Chronicle that I have not played and I'm ready to dive into it, I want to play it. 
I want to, right after this review is done, I want to sit down, I may not because I have other things to do today, but I want to go ahead and play this game. I want to dive into that Chronicle. I want to experience what this game has to offer. I enjoy what Ultra is doing. Very much so. Very much so. But also, the game is, strictly speaking, a fairly light game. And the game is a fairly tight game, which you're going to be moving around a lot of the time, and then rolling dice a lot of the time, and simply going through a procedural aspect that I enjoy the sense of exploration, I enjoy the story, I enjoy what Ultra is doing, with all the caveats that it may not be a game for you. It may be a game that has too few plays to keep it engaging for you. It may be a game that has too much luck for you. But if none of these things I've said scare you off, I actually really have a lot of fun with this one. I'm going to give this one a 3.5 out of 5. I, I almost want to give it a 4, but it's... I, I can't just mechanically speaking, I can't. And the fact that it has so limited, such a limited shelf life, I can't. It's a 3.5 out of 4, but I really do like this one. It is both a recommendation and a bit of a scare you off at the same time, depending on which aspects resonated with you more in this review. As far as final thoughts, I did final thoughts. As far as recommendations, as far as recommendations for other games, uh, first of all, Pandemic. If you're looking for a simple, clean, cooperative experience that gives you that classic bad things happen, good things happen, granted with lots of luck, but with a lot more agency control and a lot more sense of purpose and less repetitiveness, although there is repetitiveness too, Pandemic is one of the grandfathers of cooperative games and does a great job and has continued to do a great job and continues to hold its own just fine. Granted, the legacy version is better, but that's a different conversation. And then separately, if you like the chronicles of, of Ultra, if you like that sense of exploration, that sense of something new mixed with a core mechanic loop, but with a core mechanic loop that is much more interesting, Unsettled is going to level it up to the nth degree, giving you a much more solid foundation of exploration, of adventure, while still giving you these individual planets that bring their own flavor, their own narrative, their own something else. Unsettled is basically Ultra on like 14 versions of whatever. It's just, it's leveled up to the next degree. It might be a little bit too much though. It is a lot more of an obligation to set up, to table and to play, but it's also worth it at the same time. And that is everything. I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. I hope you enjoyed this video. And as always, have a good one.